Uh, she received her early degrees from Chihuahua University in uh, Beijing. And then <coughs> came to this country, did her PhD at uh, SUNY Buffalo with uh, Fred Sachs. I don't know how many of you know Fred. But Fred is Fred. There are not too many Freds <laughs> like him. And um, he did a lot of uh, work and defined really um, stretch activated channels in cardiac myosin. So uh, that's Fred. And then from there, you went to Ed Lakatas at the NIH, and there aren't two Ed Lakatas either. <laughs> and Ed uh, has done a lot of work on calcium cycling, and those of you who are familiar with more recent work, it's about um, the calcium clock in the sinus node of the heart and determining the heart rate based on calcium cycling. And then, there was uh, some time at the University of Maryland where John Lederer is and Gil Weary is, and um, from there to Lexington, right? and finally to the West Coast. So we're very happy to have you with us, and uh, thanks for coming. And we'll hear about, you know, my brain can hardly make sense of the excitation contraction coupling, but here we're having all of those subsystems, that is electrical, calcium cycling, and mechanical systems. So that's a pretty uh, daring uh, task to describe it all to us. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Dr. Rudy. It's a special pleasure and an honor for me to be here. And Dr. Rudy is such a gracious host that he showed me around this great institute, uh, we drove in the morning across the, the park. And I also know many of you came a long way from the medical center side. So thank you all for being here. I'm sure that um, I'll have fun interacting with you. So I'm here, uh, I, have, I feel I learned a lot by talking with students and faculty. <coughs> so I hope that we can exchange information and we have many overlapping interests. So I view this as, you know, we are working on a giant puzzle with millions of different pieces. So our work, I hope we can, we are working on several pieces of the puzzle and hopefully we can put together with the other pieces colleagues working on to understand the complex heart disease mechanism. Yeah. So, um, our lab, we call ourselves cardiac signaling lab, and we started from calcium, because calcium sits at the center of the excitation contraction coupling. And we have an experimental group and we also have modeling group. So we take, we closely combine experiments and modeling iteratively to gain quantitative in-depth understanding of the dynamic systems that control cardiac EC coupling. Yeah, so at the experimental side, we do uh, a lot of cellular electrophysiology, uh, confocal um, imaging of calcium signal, Recently, we also take on super resolution imaging. Then we study uh, mainly at the cell level. Yeah, we also want to connect cell levels, finding with the whole heart level phenomenon. Uh, connect also the cell level phenomenon with the molecular level events. Yeah, but our focus mainly is to integrate the molecular level events at the single cardio myocyte level, at the cell level first, because it is the basic unit of integration. Yeah, so uh, we also uh, do some uh, biochemistry and molecular biology, so we have a wet lab and we have a dry lab. Then we combine modeling experiments. So today I will uh, talk about three parts of our study. Yeah. And just to give a visual. Uh, 
that in the cardiac cycle, the heart experience um, the electrical excitation, calcium signaling, and mechanical contraction are all working at the same time. Yeah, and it also the heart rate is constantly under mechanical stress. Yeah, it experiences preload and afterload. <coughs> I found a, a very shocking video in YouTube, so I'll share with you. You probably saw this before. That's a heart in arrhythmia. So you can imagine the kind of uh, mechanical stress those myocytes might be. Now, I saw very nice movies in Dr. Rudy's lab this morning, where, you know, the model simulations so show uh, the mechanical strain and stress. So in our lab, we study three systems. So we record three channels simultaneously, the electrical recording, the calcium recording, and the contraction, uh, a sarcomere length shortening. So this is a normal cell, yeah, action potential for calcium transit and contraction. That's a single ventricular myocyte under the control of patch by pad so, we'll, so first, electrical system. So in our view, you know, we start from the dynamic system. Dynamics, so we view the arrhythmogenic activity as a perfect storm, electric storm. And as we know that the cardiac action potential is shaped by many ionic currents, so the, by the inward currents and the outward currents counterbalancing one another to determine the profile of the action potential. Yeah. So the critical question is at the cell level integration is how do different ionic currents integrate in the same cell? And previously, uh, traditional voltage clamp studies usually measure one current from one cell and measure different currents from different cells and also under different conditions in order to isolate a particular current, which is a powerful approach to understand the biophysics of ion channels. So after accumulating a lot of data, now I think the time has come to put those channels back into physiological environment in the cardiomyocytes. And another powerful approach used to integrate the current with modeling, right? So the voltage clamp data were fed into mathematical models, like Dr. Rudy, uh, being a, a pioneer and a leading lab doing the integration in mathematical model. So our approach is that we want to also do it experimentally because the model has built a conceptual framework, mathematical framework, to be able to integrate these currents. But the parameters in the model still came from experiment. So if the experimental data carry artifacts, you know, due to simplify the conditioning or other things, then those will be carried into model, right? In that sense, the model outcome, the prediction is as good as the data came from. So we want to obtain experimental data under physiological conditions. Yeah, the approach we took yeah, this is just a borrow from one of your um, figure in your paper. So the experimental approach we develop, we call onion peeling, which is a short for action potential clamp sequential dissection. Yeah, so we do a patch clamp in the cell and put the calcium in the Then the the basic steps is that we first we record the action potential from ventricular myocyte, the steady state action potential. 
then we use this action potential as the voltage clamp command to clamp the very same cell. When we do that, we record this uh, net current output is flat, right? Then we use a specific <coughs> blocker of a particular channel to inhibit that particular channel. So then we can record the compensation current. So the difference between the background and the, the blocker sensitive current give us that ion current under the action potential. For example, if we use a sodium channel blocker, TTX, we can dissect out TTX sensitive current that's flowing under this action potential in the same cell. And then we do uh, we bring this uh, one step further that we can add a second blocker to dissect second current. So I gave you a quick show of the, the second current. So here we use um, chromo to dissect out IKS under this guinea pig particular myocyte in the same cell, now we use the E4031 to dissect out IKR. Then we add barium chloride to dissect out IK1. Then we add nifedipine to dissect out calcium, alpha calcium current. Then we add SEA to dissect out sodium calcium exchange current, etc. Yeah, because there are more complications when the blockers are not specific, so we have uh, ways to deal with that. So this is uh, just an example of a set of current we can record from the same set. So being able to record multiple currents allow us to examine the counterbalancing effect of inward and outward currents. So one, so one thing that comes to mind, is it okay if we interrupt okay, you with course. question? One thing that comes to mind is, for example, if you block the l calcium current, then you reduce the calcium loading of the cell for the next beat. And then your sodium calcium exchanger that you measure next or you peel next mm -hmm. is not the one under the same conditions. Yeah, yeah. So for that problem, uh, we took the approach that we always record potassium current and sodium current first. And you so leave calcium usually dependent leave currents for a while. At the last, yeah. So usually we record the l type calcium current at the very end mm -hmm. of the experiment. Then I will show the problem, some. The problem data. is between the, let's say, the l type calcium current and the sodium calcium exchange. Yeah. It's very tricky. Yes. So I will show some data to how to disentangle those two currents. So uh, for the, the first paper we published on this uh, approach was in JMCC called the sequential dissection of currents. So AP clamp sequential dissection is the name of this technique. Uh, and when when we have a new technique, we see new things. So one important observation we made with this approach is that in that uh, project, we dis dissected all the three potassium currents and the nisodipine sensitive current under calcium buffered condition at the beginning. And we found there is a quite large cell-to-cell -cell variation in the magnitude of those currents. So two cells can have similar action potential, normal action potential, like these two cells. The action potential are not that different. However, the underlying currents can have very different magnitude. Yeah, so here we do a correlation <coughs> plot of the, the charge movement through IKS versus the charge movement through l type calcium channel. And here, every dot is one cell. So the cell, the difference between this cell and that cell can be 
very different in terms of the magnitude of the current. But, and the same thing you see when we integrate the charge movement through all three potassium channels and the calcium. Here is the calcium channel. So the, the outward and inward charge movement. And again, you can see the this cell has very large, um, so this cell has very small current for both the potassium current and the calcium current. And whereas this cell has large inward and outward current. So within single individual cell, the large inward current and the large outward current can counterbalance to shape a normal action potential. And in another cell, small inward current and small outward current can also counterbalance to shape a normal action potential. So that's something came out from this study. So that's new. That we now attention to the variability between cells. And here in the second paper, we uh, address the question of the calcium sensitive current. So here we study the sodium calcium exchanger current and the l type calcium current. These two are entangled due to you know, the calcium sensitivity. So the approach we developed was to that we do paired experiment. Yeah, for example, under this condition, the calcium was cycling during the cardiac cycle. Uh, we have calcium transient. And we use the, a blocker for N, uh, the sodium calcium exchanger, NCX. The SEA0400 is uh, available potent blocker for NCX, but it also partially blocks l -type current, like 20%. So we first use SEA to block NCX plus a little bit of calcium, L-type calcium current. Then we add my feather pin to completely block L-type calcium current. So now we have two currents and two equations, two variables. Then we solve the, uh, then we also measure, of course, the calcium sensitivity at different voltage. Then we solve uh, for the L-type calcium current and the NCX under this action potential. So this is how NCX looks like under the, under the action potential when the calcium was normally cycling. Yeah, it, first, it was the uh, outward current, then it turned inward and contribute to phase three. Then we also did experiment uh, where the calcium was buffered with high concentration EGTA. And we did the same paired experiment and calculate the NCX. So NCX is an outward current when the calcium is buffered, yeah, as expected. So this is the approach we can take to use a combination of two different blockers with different uh, potency for two different current and to solve from paired experimental data to solve for the range of the, the current under the action potential. Also, you know, this ability to record multiple currents from the same cell allows study of the, the relative strength of different currents and also how this relative strength or contribution to, for example, between three potassium currents, IKS, IKR, IK1, and each contribute a portion of the potassium charge movement. And so they have relative strength at different phase of the action potential. Then their relative contribution also shifts on the beta adrenergic stimulation <coughs> due to their different sensitivity to beta adrenergic. So in this paper uh, here, we'll compare IKS, uh, IKR, and 
IPS. So under the control condition, guinea pig, I mean potential, IPR, IPS. Then under beta adrenergic stimulation with three 30 nanomolar isoprotaranol, the IPR, IPS. So IPS is very sensitive to beta adrenergic stimulation. So by doing this, we can uh, look at the, the dose response of isoprotaranol uh, of different potassium channels have different sensitivity. Yeah. So uh, let's focus on, yeah, this is just those responses seen at different voltage point in the action potential, yeah. Uh, this is during system, and the open is during diastole. So you can see the different shift. Then we can compute the, uh, <coughs> add up for the current, and normalize to the total current. Then look at the relative strength of three currents. So here the IPS, So the IK1 is in green, IKR is in blue, and IKS is in red. So you can see when you uh, do beta adrenergic stimulation with increasing ISO concentration, IKS became more and more and become dominant at the end. So on the control condition, IKR is much larger than IKS. But on the full beta stimulation, IPS become more dominant. So it's a reversal of the dominance of the IPR and IPS on the beta adrenergic stimulation. Is that positive just the relative or the percentage relative or, or absolute value? Here we, we did, uh, uh, it's relative, we plot it relative here. Here is the absolute value. That's interesting. Uh, you, you just showed that all the cells have different cell uh, have different uh, uh, current uh, uh, density, true. right? Yeah. So are these a ratio always keep keeping Within the same? the same cell. This Within is the same cell. Yeah. So we always record the three potassium currents from the same cell right. and calculate the ratio in the same. So cell. the ratio actually keeps uh, similar, although the absolute value changes. Yes. I think the, the important thing you want to show is the crossover mm, yes. between those, and that happens in every cell. Yes. Right? So under ISO and beta adrenergic simulation, IKS crossovers yes. the IKR. But I have another point. I mean, this is this is all very true and important for the standing action potential. But there are other functions of this current that are not really represented just by the action potential morphology and shape. Mm -hmm. For example, um, rate dependence, shortening mm -hmm. of action potential duration. Yes. So IKS has very different uh, kinetic properties than IKR. Yes. And because it, you know, activation and deactivation are slow, mm -hmm. it will accumulate and build up between beats and then you get a very important role for IKS yes. in shortening the action potential duration in fast rate. So yes. functionally it becomes it's it's role becomes more important more and more important relative to the IKR story. Yes. So it's not just the right, it's not just the action potential yes. depending on what so context you your like rate dependence and yes. all kinds of other you know, Yes. For yeah. the repolarization reserve story yes. when IKR is compromised yes. and IKS yeah, so all these will ha uh, have interactions, yeah. Then we, uh, to address the, the rate dependent issue, then we need to do this experiment under different rate. Yes, yeah, slow so rate and fast rate. Yes, and yeah, so we just start to do those uh, rate dependence experiments because it's a huge amount of you can imagine. experiment to do at <laughs> different rates. Yeah. So I think the you know this. I, I guess my point is to say that sometimes people create the impression um, that IKS under basal conditions, without beta adrenergic stimulation, is not important. 
that's not a good way to state it because you know it's there mm -hmm. part, partly in order to provide ray dependence and ray dependent adaptation. You can't separate because when the heart rate increases, also beta adrenergic tone increases. But even if you separate them, just the rate itself relative to the kinetics makes IKS a very important trend. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. So this is actually, uh, you know, the heart is uh, under constant, uh, you know, vagal and the uh, adrenergic tone, right? Mm -hmm. So in certain, so do you have any correlation of your, of your uh, observed phenomenon of your ISO uh, concentration to correlate with the, the physiological uh, tone <coughs> of, of the, the beta energy stimulation? Yeah, so you know, we uh, use the ISO at the, the concentration range that's relevant to physiological right. uh, condition, like the three nanomolar here, basal level, that the 30 will be you know, more elevated level. But also, in literature, many previous experiments were done with very high ISO concentration, <coughs> 100 nanometer, even one micromolar. So those were really super saturated. Yeah. So I think that we, our intention is to investigate uh, physiological and pathological range of the beta and genetic tone. So really, you know, why we took pain to do a dose response uh, is try to understand the, this subtle, more subtle uh, aspect of the dose-dependent regulation. What, what animal was this and what rate was the pace that? It was pace that uh, when it hurts, these are guinea pig, in ventricular myocytes. Yeah, right now, more recently, we are uh, working using rabbit, which is closer to human potential, also at body temperature. Yeah, so, so for rabbit study, we are pacing between one hertz to five hertz. Try to cover the range that's physiologically relevant. So, you know, then for studying heart failure, um, arrhythmia mechanism, heart failure, then we know that HF condition involves changes in many ionic currents and also calcium handling system, etc. So using the onion peeling, we can examine these uh, simultaneous changes in different currents. Yeah, here we show an example of our preliminary data. You know, this is from rabbit ventricular myocyte. That's the action potential, normal, calcium transient. And this is a set of ion currents from rabbit ventricular myocyte. So you can see ITO here. Guinea pig didn't have much ITO. And here's the late sodium current. And this is potassium currents over here. IK1 blue. And the nifedipine my, my that I set out both uh, l and MCX. Then we compare with uh, a cell from a uh, rapid heart failure model that was pressure and volume overload in this arrhythmogenic HF model was in collaboration with Stanford's lab. You know, originally, this model was developed uh, by uh, Hogwist and Burst in Chicago. Now we have it in UC Davis also. And so this HF cell had a, a longer APD, and these are the currents we dissect out. So you can see there is a reduction of IK1 and consistent with previous finding. And here we found also an increase of late sodium current. And here's a big increase of the calcium current, sodium calcium exchange current. Also, the IPO looks different from the control. So this demonstrates what this approach can do 
you know, what it is good for. I think it is good for connecting the ion channel of physics to integrate at a single cell level and connect the phenomena at a single cell level to the tissue level. Uh, another use, I think, will be important, is to study, to fingerprint the complex drug effects on multiple ionic currents. Because many drugs are dirty drugs. They are not specific to one channel. For example, renalazine, the wonder drug. And this is the renalazine sensitive current. And you can see renalazine um, effect on different ionic currents were studied before using voltage clamp. So it was known that renalazine blocks late sodium current, also some of the L-type <coughs> current, and some IKR. So you can see in this renalazine sensitive current profile under the AP clamp, it's a composite current. Now we can compare this with the fingerprinting data that we generate with specific channel blockers, right? So we can have a fingerprint, then we can use the fingerprint to decompose a dirty drug sensitive current. So this will find applications. Okay, so that's the story about the onion peeling and AP clamp study. Then we know that in cardiac myocytes, the electrical system is coupled with calcium handling system because calcium, uh, many ion channels are sensitive to calcium, also to calcium carmodulin can K2 modulation, and also sodium calcium exchanger is sitting at the interface of the calcium control system and the electrical system. So we want to study under the physiological condition how calcium homeostasis, calcium transit during hydrogen potential affect ion currents. Yeah. So one most important feature that I'll point out is that calcium handling system is a positive feedback system. Yeah, due to the calcium-induced calcium release gating of the Ronidin receptor. So positive feedback system can become unstable. Yeah, so we do calcium imaging study. Can we turn on the So here we show a ventricular myocyte. So this is a ventricular myocyte showing spontaneous calcium sparks. Oh. Are the T two mules intact in themselves? Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are spontaneous calcium sparks. And when there are many sparks arising in near synchrony, it coalesces into calcium waves. Yeah, this is due to the Ronidin receptor clusters. They are like gunpowders, right? And they are spatially separated at a nice distance in normal cell under control condition. And with the right sensitivity. So the sparks do not usually induce waves. However, on the disease condition, the Ryan sensitivity to calcium can increase, can become more sensitive. Or under certain uh, heart disease condition, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the spacing of Ryan cluster can get closer. So it's like putting gunpowder piles closer. And that under those conditions, spontaneous sparks can induce calcium waves. So when the calcium waves arise, they increase intracellular calcium concentration. And 
through sodium calcium exchanger that the, <coughs> the cell uh, will try to get rid of the calcium and in exchange three sodium come in when calcium goes out so it's electrogenic right it polarizes the cell membrane and that causes DAD and triplet AP. So to study this phenomenon we need to study the feedback from calcium to electrical So the, <clears throat> the technique we developed to study this, we call the self AP plant with calcium cycling. So what it is that we, now we do not buffer calcium with any exogenous buffer. The internal endogenous buffer is still there. So when we clamp the cell by its own action potential, and match all the intracellular and extracellular solution milieu. The cell is able to keep its natural homeostasis, so the calcium will cycle during the action potential. Then we and we use that to study the late sodium current inference action potential. So. Here is a recording of three potassium currents and the late sodium current. Late sodium current was dissected out at the beginning with TTX that include the, the peak calcium current component, but you know we cannot see the peak it's saturating. But this, under the action potential, we can see that this tint late sodium current profile. And this profile looks very different from what people usually record using conventional voltage clamp protocol. And if we use ATX2 to activate late sodium current, we get a huge increase of late sodium current here. Of course, this prolonged APD Any question about this? And what happened also at the action potential size? So if we let the calcium to cycle naturally, we see EADs under you know large dose <coughs> of ATX2. And this EAD actually right on top of the calcium oscillations. Here's the fuel of two measurement of the calcium. Yeah. The calcium oscillation in time this calcium rise earlier than the turn of the first EAB event. And also if we buffer the calcium with ETTA or beta, we can get rid of this EAB. Of course the long APD is still there. So this tells uh, that the late sodium current, you know, cause sodium overload. Sodium overload will be cause calcium overload through sodium calcium exchanger if running at the reverse mode. So the influence of late sodium current are twofold. One is to increase the inward current to prolong APD. Another is to overload cell with sodium and the calcium to cause calcium oscillations and the EAD. And also the same mechanism plays yeah, behind EAD and the DAD. EAD again, when the DAD exceeds the threshold for sodium channel, it has a triggered action potential. Yeah, so the late sodium current really does two major harm. Yeah, but there is even more complicated story mm -hmm. because once you prolong the action potential duration, it depends on what voltage. Mm -hmm. If you prolong the action potential duration at the top potentials, yeah. not, not, not below zero millivolts, but above, mm -hmm. then you also reactivate the LTEC calcium current. Yes. Yeah. And that contributes to EAD and could be the major current during EAD formation. In addition to that, by prolonging the action potential duration, you have a much longer duration for the anti-calcium current, so you directly 
calcium overload the cell without, you know, secondary to sodium overload. So it, it's a complicated, it's a complicated, it depends, it depends a lot on what voltage yes. you prolong the actual potential of the ratio. Yes, yes, yeah, that's true. So our type channel is also involved during this process, yeah. But if you block late sodium current, like we did with uh, the, the new uh, compound for the GS967, developed by Gilea in their, uh, for their antiarrhythmia drug development. So this compound specifically blocks late sodium current, has little effect on the peak sodium current unlike GS. So GS was able to restore the action potential. Then I think I'll uh, spend some time to uh, talk about our more recent work on uh, coupling the mechanical system with the calcium control system. Of course, you know, people ask, you know, what kind of heart disease are related to mechanical stress? Under the normal condition, the heart is constantly under mechanical stress. Right? And also, on the disease condition, excessive mechanical stress can be put on the cardiovascular side, just to name a few conditions that can put a lot of mechanical stress. So the knowledge gap is the feedback. And the mechanical transduction has been a tough field because it's hard to control mechanical stress. Yeah, and in order to understand at the cell level and at the molecular level, you want to have a, a method to control the mechanical load at a single cell level. So that's what we developed. And you're probably all aware of the uh, the technique also developed by um, Baltimore group, John Lederer and uh, Chris Wall and Ben Prosser. So they attach two uh, glass rod to the two ends of the myocyte stretch. So our system is uh, uh, different. That we develop a three-dimensional elastic gel system and embed single cardiomyocyte in the gel. So for cell in gel technique. So this technique, we uh, use polymers, non-toxic to the cell to embed cell in the gel very quickly within minutes. Then this system is porous, so allows to wash drug in and out, and we can use electric field stimulation. And also it is transparent for imaging. So using this system, here's a, a quick visual of how it looks, the cell in gel. And we embed fluorescent beads in the gel to indicate uh, the displacement when the cell is pulling the gel. Yeah. A strong cell can contract hundreds of beads. So with this system, we first did a mechanical analysis of the system to see the kind of uh, string of stress on the cell in this system. And we collaborate with John Shell and Yunzu and did a 3D mechanical analysis. And here is the string map. So this is the cell, that's the gel. So of course, you know, you have the, the red means larger value. You have bigger string at the ends. And when the cell contract, it bulges out in the middle. It's an isovolumic contraction. So you can see in the string view. Then knowing the uh, viscoelastic modulus of the gel, we can calculate the stress. So the stress map shows that the stress, the ends, of the cell experience high mechanical uh, stress. So we have longitudinal tension and transverse compression on the cell. Then on the cell surface, we have surface traction, surface traction along the surface. 
and surface traction has the shear component and the normal component. So this cell is in the gel experience all this mechanical stress. So here is an example of the cell in gel contraction. We measure the aspect ratio uh, to put back into the model calculation later. Here you can see this is a supple mirror length shortening during contraction. So this cell in gel contraction reach steady state. Then we can dissolve the gel to release the cell into the solution and record the load free contraction. That's what most experiments are done load free. So here is the load free contraction. So you can see that the in cell in gel, the contraction is slower than load free and the amplitude is less than load free as expected. And if we can also tune the elasticity or stiffness of the gel to put more mechanical stress. And some cell will develop alternates when they are pulling low. And we dissolve the gel doing the self-control experiment. And the same cell released into solution doing load free contraction. And it can reach steady state on the load free but it could not under the loaded condition. Interesting. And recently we are working on heart failure cells, you know, to see whether the cells will be, uh, will develop alternate synthesis in the nature cells. And so this is the part of the mechanical uh, analysis, mechanical study at the single cell level that we are doing, ongoing study. Then another uh, group of the study is to look at the mechanical chemo transduction to see how mechanical stress is transduced to alter the calcium signal in the side. So we use the cell in gel system and we do confocal imaging of calcium signal and to do line scan along the longitudinal axis and build up image in time and we use beads to indicate the movement. Then you can see under the load free condition, here you see we use field stimulation and here is the calcium transit under the action potential. And this calcium transient cause cell contraction. Then uh, after systole the cell goes into diastole and the calcium signal clears up pretty nicely under low free condition. However, under mechanically loaded condition, here you see a calcium transient which causes a smaller contraction, but you see a lot of spontaneous calcium activity during diastole. Here's the 3D rendition show sparks during diastole, and that's the control condition, much low spark. So the load-free condition has very low spark rate during diastole. In a soft gel, you can see increase of spark rate. In a stiffer gel, you see a big increase of spark load. Then if we use lab starting to treat cells to decouple contraction from calcium, the cells stop contracting and the spark rate went back down towards control level. So this shows that these sparks are indeed uh, induced by the stress. Yeah, the system is non-toxic. And also, at the systolic calcium transient site, you can see that this is the control calcium transient the black. Then under the mechanical load, there is a increase of the calcium transient. That due to, again, the mechanical chemo transduction. And this increase of calcium transient should increase the, enhance the contractility on the mechanical load and contribute to the NRAP effect seen at the whole heart level where you mechanically load the heart, you see increase of contractility. 
so next question, uh, we also examine the temporal uh, development of this phenomenon. So here we uh, pace a cell, and starting first beat, second beat, etc. At the beginning, the diastole was clean at the second beat here. And it did take more than about 10 beats to, for cell to develop diastolic calcium sparks. And if we stop pacing, you know, the cell stop contraction and this calcium sparks clear out immediately. So there is a delay in this process to build up the signal. And just thinking, you know, in an attempt to relate this phenomenon to NREP effect, we know that NREP effect does take a short time to develop. <coughs> and we think this mechanical chemotransduction contributes to the NREP. The next question we ask is, what is the signaling pathway, yeah, the intermediate signaling that um, mediates the mechanical transduction? So we uh, study the nitric oxide signaling system in this project. And we want to understand uh, the participation of NO signal especially because NO signals is related to some uh, mechanically, uh, some disease that involve defect in the mechanical structure like muscular dystrophy. Uh, here is, all these experiments are done with the cell in gel system on the mechanical load. This is the control, you see the sparks here. If we inhibit ENOS, with its specific inhibitor, it did not clear all the sparks. If we inhibit NOS, it clears out the sparks. Then we, you know, to uh, in case the inhibitors are not specific enough, we did a transgenic mouse with NOS knockout, diastole is clean, similar to NOS inhibitor effect. Enos knockout, very sparky, even more so than the Enos inhibitor. And if we inhibit Enos in the Enos knockout, it can also clear, clear out the sparks. Yeah, all these data are consistent, pointing to Enos playing a major role in mediating the mechanical kind of transduction. All this, this data are statistical evidence of that. Then when we see the difference between ENOS and NOS, then we ask a further question, why? Why NOS and ENOS play different roles here? And the hypothesis we tested was that NOS and ENOS were known to be localized in different subcellular compartments. So we think that the location of the NOS is very important for the diffusive signal of NO, because NO is a very um, labile molecule that it travels short distance. For diffusive signaling, the source of the uh, NO, the, the distance between the source and the target molecule will be important. So we measure the spatial distance between NOS and RYR, and between NOS and RYR. Confocal imaging uh, gave nice picture, but was not, doesn't have enough resolution. So we use the structure of the illumination of microscopy <coughs> to do silver-res imaging. And we found the So the green is NOS and the red is RYR. Because it's neat to see it in 3D.
the spacing here is a typical sarcomere distance. Uh, yes, yeah, under the, 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 the longitudinal direction, right. you can see the sarcomere pattern. Yeah, then we measure the nearest neighbor distance. Compare NOS to RYR distance with the ENOS to RYR. Okay, the computer is malfunctioning. So while you reboot, I'd like to ask a question. Yes. When you look at individual calcium sparks in an in entire cell, can, is it possible to make a statement about the local sarcomere activity in the vicinity of the spark? In yes. other words, when the spark goes off, do the, spark, do the sarcomeres right next to it go boom? Today. Yes, this is the new project we are doing. So we are developing a new imaging technique for the second harmonic generation with two photon fluorescence. So SHG can, with SHG you can see the A lens. It's a sub imaging of the mechanical structure. Uh, I can show you some data. I the, I okay, the answer is basically it's yes, that you can yes, measure, you can, you can, you can see w with local, w with spatially, with spatio-temporally resolved uh, calcium spark within the cell, mm -hmm. you can look at the sarcomeres in the vicinity of the spark and see them move. Mm -hmm. In case it doesn't do that, I'll use the structure, uh, functional study, and also provide data for modeling that you can feed this measurement into the model. So using the same method, you know, we example, we show the data for NOS and ENOS study, then we also use other inhibitor, for example, NOX2 inhibitor that inhibit the reactive oxygen species generation to build up a uh, pathway map for mechanical chemo transduction. And this is an ongoing work. So, so far, we found that uh, NOS is involved, NOX2 is also involved, and ENOS plays a different role. We also found that KMK2 is involved. And in disease models, this can change the involvement of these 
molecules can change. So for this uh, F FHC model, just pay attention to here. Um, the control cell, if you inhibit NOx2, you can clear out the spark. But in the FHC model, you cannot clear out the spark. So disease condition can change. This so, you know, I quickly finish by showing some preliminary modeling done by latent user. So we are connecting this pathways model now to, to model this uh, feedback system. And the preliminary that should load free can be uh, load free contraction in time. And if you uh, put the mechanical load down, the contraction decreases and slow, becomes slower. If you turn on the mechanical chemo transduction, it can enhance contraction. And if you turn the gain higher, you can go higher. But if the mechanical load is heavy and the gain is high, you can induce oscillations during diastole. And indeed, in experimental data, you see oscillations during diastole. These are the paste, one, two, three. And these are the spontaneous oscillations during diastole. Then in the FHC model, this is a very pronounced. The Spontaneous waves. So we are investigating this issue because FHC is known to have increased malfilament sensitivity to calcium. So it, now we have developed a set of nice tools to allow us to study the feedback between these three systems. And our mission, you know, hope is to understand, prevent treat heart diseases. I want to thank people who did work, our group, and also collaborators you know, with the protein uh, chemis chemist and Don Burrs, always a great colleague at the Public Center, <coughs> other researchers <coughs> at UC Davis. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's truly an interdisciplinary collaboration we are enjoying. The, the, I think it, what it takes to understand the complex system. Thank, Thank you, you very much.